No, hold on. Hmm. Hello. Hello. Why? Is the broadcast Richard's attendance. Richard's I attendance. Just the wrong button. Probably <laughs> yes. You're broadcasting us to the nation and the world. Oh dear. I can see people joining us now. Hello, everybody. Well, this is good fun for you. I've just clicked the start webinar button so you get to see behind the scenes. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. Yes, but you, you do. Haven't, you haven't clicked your start webcam button so we can hear you, Richard, but we can't see you. Everyone can, ah, oh, there he is. So I just wade in, cause a load of chaos, don't even put my camera on and that's it. So. <laughs> this I mean, is great fun, it's great fun. Richard, as you know, if I had a pound every time you'd done that, I think I'd have a pound. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. That is funny. Apologies. Well, now we've got some B-roll footage that we can uh, use for. We can have for a Who have we got joining us? We got Damien, Daryl, Denzel, Gareth. There's some names I recognise in there. So, hello everybody. <laughs> uh, very good. I love it. I love it. So I'm uh, bringing up our slides from Violet. Everyone know that we've. Or do you think everyone knows what's happened here? Well, I think everybody realizes that we hit the broadcast button too early. And if we were to stop it now, we would all be over. So we don't want to end our show before it begins. So we'll just we'll just continue to broadcast and you know we'll do by that we'll edit the, the the video here. So I'm just making work for you left, right, and center here, Violet, am I? <laughs> I don't even know how to edit videos. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. That's, oh, that's fine. Fine. No, no, no. We, we can help you out with that. So, yeah. You are just one a person. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we've got people from all over the world uh, joining us. Hello, Michael. I see a few tech drivers joining us as well. Excellent. And we've also had a discussion before your arrival about Sheila or Sheila, as she will now be known. Sheila, yeah. I liked the uh, Crocodile Dundee reference you uh, <laughs> I was, one of my favorite yeah, I, films. I realize it's totally Australian, not UK and all, but yeah, it, that was funny. <laughs> I'll tell you what was interesting though, many years ago when I went to San Francisco, the number of cab drivers who just assumed that I was Australian rather than English. So the, if, you, if you're East Coast, there seems to be a sense of East Coast people understand the difference. And when you go to the West Coast, we're we Brits appear to merge into a sort of, mm, I think you might be Australian, I'm not really quite sure. Because I've never had that when I'm when I'm on the East Coast, uh, and I've been there quite a lot, and I've never had anyone misinterpret my accent as Australian there, but only when in California. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, easy to mix that. <laughs> the California, yeah, are, they're, they're a little confused as to how close the UK is versus how close uh, Australia is. Right, they're halfway in between. Yeah, but I mean, look, it's a little geography. It's a sport of geography between the US and the UK. You know, most Brits, if you showed an empty map of the US with the states outlined but not named, couldn't tell you anything other than New York. In the same way that a lot of Americans would probably find it quite challenging to point specifically to Great Britain on a map of wider Europe. So you know, it's a, it's a bit quid pro quo, really. I think. Yeah. yeah, we, had, we yeah. had a great spot the other day, didn't we, during a tribal gathering, Craig, where, um, and you're a former geography teacher, aren't you? I am, yes. <laughs> and we got the state names completely wrong, offending people from Missouri, Michigan, <laughs> and where else as well. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. That's so funny. Oh. We've got lots of people joining us. Let us know in the chat box where you're joining us from. What? We've got Jersey, Gareth, Francesco, lots of people joining us. Some names I recognize and some new friends as well. Well, I'm very disappointed because, of course, my go to lookout is Johnny, Johnny, Jonathan Fox, but uh, he doesn't appear to be in our list today. He doesn't. <laughs> By the way, for anyone who can see me, um, this will be sorted out on Thursday morning. Well, you couldn't have it done before because uh, before this webinar, because we recorded that promo video. Yeah. You made the big deal about your um, your hair there during the promo my video. Samsonite, my Samsonite locks, yeah. 
Uh, so was for, con for continuity, Craig, you've got to keep the hair through this webinar. Well, that is another reason why I wore this particular T-shirt, because it was also the same one. It has been washed, but uh, I'd like to make that clear. But it is the same one for continuity purposes. <laughs> Oh. If, you are, if you are joining us early, the webinar has not started yet. We're going to start on the hour. Um, but somebody, we won't say who, but their name isn't Violet, Craig or JB, clicked the start webinar button early. Um, yeah, that's just what I do. So we thought we'd just give you a behind the scenes peek on what's going on. So. <laughs> this is the meanwhile, rambling. Meanwhile, I'm playing with Google Docs and figuring out, you know, how to use this with respect to go to webinar. So. Oh. That looks promising. Maybe, maybe, but you don't see. It's funny. It doesn't show the slides content. Right? Does it? What does it say? Loading? Is that what I see on your screen? Loading at the moment, yeah. Loading. Uh, just yeah. one question: Is the feedback from my side really bad still? Um, no. No, yeah. Well, I mean, when, when you better, say really we, bad, I mean we better. we can hear it, but it's not it's not ruining the presentation. It's just something okay. that you can hear a bit in the background. <laughs> There are other things that are going to ruin the presentation. <laughs> yeah, like one of the presenters pressing the broadcast to all attendees 10 minutes early. Mm. <laughs> it's funny. You know what? I'm going to keep this in Safari view just because it's the I, Google Docs here and the, their presentation form. When they share a window, go to webinar doesn't seem to like it. So it'll all be good. We'll make it work. Yeah, yeah. Violet, you're going to get a crash course in video editing, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just edit that out after. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I sat down yesterday. Um, as, as Craig will know, I'm surrounded with some really good people who um, are much better at me at doing all sorts of things like podcast editing and video editing yesterday. But I sat down because I realized I was like, if I was left on my own, disconnected from the world, how would I do any of this stuff? So I actually sat down and learned how to edit a video from scratch yesterday. Yeah, nice. I, I, JB, I've got to tell you, I felt like the world's biggest idiot because uh, Jenks, who's uh, in charge of our vendor management, she was saying, uh, click here and do this. And I'm like, what, this? No, no, not this, this. I felt like what, a complete end what user. What tool were you using? Were you using like Adobe? An Adobe no, uh... I was just using a tool called Flixio, which is uh, a cloud-based okay. editing tool. So it was really, so... really good, very intuitive, but I'm a klutz when I come to these things, so there you go. I, I, I've gotten into Adobe Premiere Pro and trying to use that for some of our videos and stuff, and I love it. It's incredibly powerful, but if you don't understand the workflow and understand like what dots do what and where to click this and that, oh my God, it's so confusing. Yeah, I mean, um, during lockdown, I, I invested some time in Camtasia, which seems to be used by quite a lot of people, yeah. and yeah. I did some, you know, sort of half promo, half self self kind of training videos and I, I well two things really firstly I found it quite enjoyable and it certainly is a skill it isn't like writing a word document where you just go ba 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 boom done you know you can understand why two minutes of recorded video take two hours to edit um, but also I think it, it's amazing how difficult it is to do well without oh. lots and lots and lots of training even if you take some really well shot footage you can make the film look rubbish if you edit it badly. But there was such a lot of power. I even bought a green screen and I tried that and I stuck bits together and added an underpinning audio track. And it, I, it was great fun when it was relatively quiet in lockdown. But yeah, it's, a, it's I have a lot more respect for people who do editing now. Oh, when you see, that Oscar, you see that Oscar being given over for yeah. editor, you think you've really earned your money on that. One. It, exactly. I've, I, I total appreciation for directors of movies. And I think of how long it takes me to make like a two or three minute clip. Mm. And when they're making a two and a half hour, you know, action flick, it's just, it's crazy. So, it's hey, incredible. guess what? We are like 40 seconds away from, from our time. So hopefully Violet's ready to do the whole introduction and everything. <laughs> 40 seconds. I'm, I'm extremely it. nervous. <laughs> and Richard disappeared. Yeah, I see how he is. Let's hope oh, he's not press stop it's webinar. webinar. <laughs> oh. Here he is. Great. Oh, he's back. Okay. He's keeping you on your toes. So. I think he did that on purpose. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like place blame, 
for like starting the broadcast early, but you know, thanks, Richard. Really, <laughs> uh, Violet, do you want us to sort of shut up for five seconds to give you an edit point? I don't know how to edit video. <laughs> oh, I do. I want her to do that. Yeah. Okay. Can we, can we just sort of slowly count to five silently in our heads and just stay still and silent? So at least JB's got an edit point of something. So I've got this is the first ever webinar I've been a part of where we've got positive feedback before the webinar started because Gareth is saying he loves how we're styling it out here. Yeah. So for anybody joining us on the hour, we're going to start recording next, but somebody press the start webinar button 10 minutes early and everybody flooded in and that somebody was me. So I'm really sorry. So we love Jay, for it. Craig and Violet just freaked out and I was like, oh, we'll just have a chat and carry on. <laughs> All right. So some silence here. Take it away, Violet. All right. Um, so. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our MSP Bostoff webinar um, called the clandestine interview. And we're gonna be covering the prospecting process and Craig and Richard and JB are gonna be sharing with you their, um, some of their best kept, tea, uh, best kept secret tips for success. Um, and so what is MSP Blastoff? So Domots, uh, we host a variety of webinars. We host our bi-monthly demos, which are perfect if you're new to Domots. We show you around the software and the main features. And then we have our partner integration series. We recently collaborated with Synchro and Hostify. And then we have our technical series, which covers uh, using our API. Um, and we've got an episode coming up on automating SNMP setups. Um, with our API, and this is our MSP Blastoff series, and it's really about thought leadership and collaborating with the best industry experts and real MSP owners to give those who attend actionable tips um, through discussion that you can apply to your business. So I'll just say, if you're interested in participating in an episode, you can always reach out to us on marketing at domops.com. We'd love to hear from you. And with that, I'll get into the introduction of today's speakers. So with us today, we have Richard Tubb. He's the IT MSP business expert guru. He produces all kinds of content in the MSP space and he's everywhere. Uh, so we're very happy to have him with us. And then we have Craig Sharp, who's an MSP owner and he's also a tribal elder on Tech Tribe. And you may, um, know him from other places within the industry and then we have jb fowler who's our cpo at domots and you if you're familiar with domots you probably know him from other webinars uh, so with that i'm going to hand it over oh yes and very important this is an interactive discussion so we really want you to ask us questions throughout the webinar and i'm going to be looking for gaps in the discussion to to get those questions answered on the air Perfect, perfect. Violet, thank you so much. First of all, a couple things I want to say. Richard being an expert on broadcasting things, I really appreciate him, him pushing the uh, broadcast button 10 minutes early. That's really good. I also want to point out that I did my best to make sure that I was wearing the same jacket that I had in that picture there here today. And Craig, we're going to leverage you for keeping the time since you have that massive clock in the back. How does that sound? That sounds absolutely perfect. More than happy to be a, a timekeeper. It is the correct time, unlike on a recent uh, webinar that I did, but yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Nothing more confusing than having your time off. So, hey, I wanted to, I wanted to point out a couple things. Um, Craig, you and I were having a conversation about the interviewing process right interviewing customers and how that works and you know we, we really boiled it down to it's really how do you prospect for for new customers and how does an msp right as how does a service provider go about finding new clients and what was so funny what was so funny is that you use the word clandestine right and i i loved it right i'm like that's so true, right? You're really, while, while you're looking for new business, while you're prospecting for new business, you're also really doing an interview with that particular 
uh, or let's call them potential client to make sure they're a good fit for you. And I loved I loved the term clandestine because it's kind of a secretive secret mission that that you should be on to make sure that not only are you a good fit for them, but they're a good fit for you. And that's kind of how we came up with the name. Uh, I assume you remember that conversation that we had. Yeah, I do, and and it really is an interesting point because I think many people in our industry are quite anxious. They're quite concerned. They're they're very put off by the idea of doing what we would call sales in inverted commas. And actually, I think the the clandestine element of what we were speaking about came around by me trying to point out that well, when I do that, I don't actually make it clear that I am selling. I don't make it clear that this is a sales meeting. Most of what I do that generates new opportunities for us are as part of a visit, a, a sort of a casual drop in. I appreciate those watching around the world will have different ways of doing it. In the US, I know geography is a problem, so you don't just drop into customers. But you know, the way I do it is as part of my general work, you pop in, you say hello, but that is your clandestine opportunity to prospect for opportunities without necessarily declaring, hello, I'm going to visit you and this will be a sales meeting because immediately the customer is on guard. And so you want to do it casually rather than in a very clear and obvious way. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. When we, when you and I were, were chatting about this, we were talking about, you know, okay, first of all, how does this process work? And then we're thinking, you know, from a business perspective, right? Who better knows how to how to deal with customers than Richard Tubb, right? So that's why we had to bring him into this conversation. So I'm super excited. I mean, Richard, what's your thoughts on, on the whole prospecting process here and how you go about finding customers and, and really what, what Richard said there? Or what Craig said there, excuse me. It's fascinating, isn't it? And so for, for those of you in the audience I've not had the pleasure of uh, meeting yet, and I, I can see many of you that I do know. So I used to run a managed service provider business based out of Birmingham in the UK. Craig and I, in fact, used to be competitors, very friendly competitors, but competitors all the same. So, you know, when I was uh, given the opportunity to sit in on this webinar with Craig, 25 years later, I want to ask him, how did he win so much business away from me when we were running MSPs up against one another? So that's some, we're all going to learn something from here. But JB, to your, um, to your question, you know, uh, the whole prospecting process, I think I speak for many people in the audience. I certainly, you know, speak for myself here when I say that I'm a massive technician. I'm a, a geek. I love technology. And that's why I got into the managed service provider business. However, being a good technician, being a good IT person and being a salesperson are like two completely different things, or so I thought. So I used to get stressed. I used to get, you know, quite anxious about going into sales meetings, about networking, about prospecting, all of those sales things. But like most people, I think, joining us today, I got into this industry because I enjoy helping people. And for me, the you know the the sales switch was flicked when I realised that actually I'm not going in to meetings to persuade anybody to buy something from me. I'm going in there to help people. And so me as a technician, and for anybody watching this who is you know a technician primarily, uh, and I know Craig isn't, for instance, that's why he's so good at uh, sales. Um, but for most of us who go into this industry, we go in to help people. Sales is helping people, connecting them with the products and solutions that they need. It is not about persuading somebody to buy something that they don't need. You know, this stereotype that we've got of the slimy used car salesman, JB, you know, that's what most people think of in sales. Sales is not that sales. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Why did you associate my name with slimy used car salesman? <laughs> I don't understand, but okay, let's continue on. Hey, if the cat fits, JB, if the cat fits. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. I'll go with that. <laughs> so, you know, Richard, your your point that you're making, I, I I think is a really is a really strong point, and it's actually something that you know, Domotes is a vendor, right? We we're we're selling a software as a service solution for MSPs, integrators alike. One of the things that we're finding on our sales side is that there needs to be an it's one thing to be talking about speeds and feeds, right? All the technical features of a certain service, a certain product, things of that nature. But I do think it's important to have a technical background. 
in, in this type of industry at, uh, for sales, right? Or at least having a, uh, let's call it a partner in crime that can help you with the sales side and being able to understand um, really what your customers are, are talking about, what their needs are. And in fact, I could even, let, that, let me fast forward to the next slide here because I, I think this is interesting, right? Speaking your customer's language, we, we made the comment here, your customers don't speak tech. Um, my, my thoughts on this is yes, that's, that's true, but you also do have customers that have technical questions and technical answers. And so you, you do need to be able to address those things. So mm. I'm gonna ask it this way. I mean, Craig, what's your thoughts on the way this slide itself was framed, right? What, what, do, you, what do you feel, how do you feel we need to speak to a customer's language? I, I, I partly agree with what you say about you have to have a technical background, but I think you have to have a technical understanding in order to come up with a variety of solutions. But I don't necessarily think that that solution or various solutions need to be explained to the client in a technical way. So what I mean by that is uh, you could go and have a conversation with a client and not understand that what they're saying to you is something pretty simple or to you trivial such as I've got a real anxiety about my staff working remotely from home I really want to have the confidence that they're able to access all of our information whilst at the same time not bringing a threat to, to the business now that might be as technical as that person that business owner is going to get but immediately in your mind, you're thinking secure VPNs, you're thinking about all sorts of technical issues, but you don't necessarily immediately revert back to the client with that technical outline. Me, if a client was saying, I have concerns about home working, I really want to make sure that they're secure and, uh, and accessing our, our information, my response there would be, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. We have a number of clients who have similar concerns. And actually, we've got a couple of different solutions that I think would really solve that problem for you. W would you like me to give you a little bit more information or a little bit more background? So what you're doing is you're, you're to, to Richard's point, you're helping the customer solve their problems. But I think it's important to bear in mind that what you think of as technical is never going to be reached as a level with a customer. You know, everything's relative. I did a physics qualification at school but I don't know as, as much as Einstein ever did it's all it's all a relative thing so what a, what a client thinks of as really really technical you would probably think of as relatively standard relatively you know mundane but you it's about solving their problems I think Richard's point was excellent it's you know homeworking concern is secure VPNs all the, all that kind of stuff but you just talk about it as solving their concern over security you solve issues about lost data and backup as a well we have a solution for that we can create a backup you don't need to tell them how you're doing it you don't need to tell them what product you're using so i think it's about reassurance that you have a solution reassurance that that's a technically competent solution but that's where it finishes you don't need to give them yeah. the detail yeah yeah richard what, what you want to add some tidbits I, to that definitely because you know, I said earlier on, many of us got into this industry because we enjoy helping people and because we're really good technicians. And I, I know many of the audience here are phenomenal world class technicians. That is a blessing because we know how to fix stuff. It's also a curse, though, JB, because what yeah. tends to happen and Craig, you know, I learned this off him years and years ago. As I said, he won a lot of business away from me when he was uh, running his uh, competitive MSP. You go in there and as somebody who wants to help, as somebody who's highly technical, you immediately jump in when the uh, customer, when the client, when the prospect gives you a problem, you immediately jump in to be their savior or that is the the desire that you've got. Oh, I can fix that for you. We need to do a secure VPN. Blah, 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 blah. What I actually learned was to temper that instinct. And instead of letting my ego take over and proving that I was the smartest person in the room, which to be fair, didn't happen very often anyway, but I would uh, sit there and I would say, okay, I'd ask some dummy questions. So yeah. when they said to me, okay, um, this is the problem that we've got, instead of going, right, I can solve that for you and immediately jump in and be the hero, I would pause and I'd say, okay, um, what does that mean? How does that affect you? Why have you tried to fix that already? And these sort of dummy questions. Now, this is going to be really difficult for lots of us watching this because 
we think we know the answers we probably do know the answers and the instinct is to jump in to save somebody but by having a conversation and exploring and coming together for a solution together with the prospect it builds up this trust and people it, it, it's one thing for you to say to a prospect oh your problem will be this and it will be costing you that and you know all these consequences it is a completely different thing to hear the prospect to hear the client say it out loud to you and then for you to say how can we you know how do you think we can fix that yeah. because you are not persuading them you're part of the solution then you are working collaboratively to get that solution and so for me jb and you can tell i love talking <laughs> so the instinct to keep quiet and to listen you know um it, it was something i really had to cultivate but i, I think it's hugely powerful I, I heard i heard both of you say the same thing in in, in two different ways right one, one of the thing is one thing is you've you've got to ask questions right it's less about preaching it's less about proselytizing why your solution your product is the greatest thing since sliced bread you need to ask questions but one of the things i heard you say richard too was perspective right if, if i could use that that word here um you guys mind if i segue to a quick story which i think is fairly relevant here yeah um when when um my wife and i have been married now for 22 years. I, I hope she's not listening because maybe I got that wrong. But one of the things that that um, we did before we before we got married is we talked to um, oh, the preacher that was going to marry us. And, and one of the things he talked about, which I think was so relevant, was we all have these videotapes about how we grew up, what what marriage was supposed to look like. I, I saw it from my parents' perspective. My wife saw it from her parents' perspective and the different challenges and how they grew up. And I think it was really interesting because what happens is, is when all of a sudden you, you leave that, um, the, when you leave your family and you all of a sudden are creating a new family, all of a sudden you're blending these videotapes. Now, it's interesting to hear when you talk about perspective, Richard, because in some sense your customer, right, he has a problem he thinks he knows how to solve it, even if he's not a technical person, because he heard, you know, his colleagues say something, he heard, he sees what his competition is doing about it, but now he's coming to you with a perspective that may or may not be the best perspective. And I think it's your job as a service provider to figure out, okay, how do I find out what this person's perspective is? How did they come to this conclusion? And then how do I steer them in a way that I think is best based on my perspective, right? Based on what I think I know. And that's a, that's a long-winded way to say, I love what you guys are talking about, right? It's some of the secret tips that I think we wanna get across here. But do you have any thoughts on, on this aspect of it? Uh, Craig, I'll let you go first. Well, I, I think in summary of your point, I think it's really important to understand that every time you talk to a prospect it and technology is not at the top of their thought process it might be the top of yours because that's kind of what you do you know as a uh, i'm trying to think of what 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 the famous phrase is but but ultimately you know if all you hold in your hand is a hammer then every problem is a nail you understand what i mean you know every time you go in knowing about technology you will always try to find a technological way in which you can implement it so so it, the first thing to do is stop thinking like a technician and just listen to the to the prospect it could be by prospect i mean existing customer or somebody you've never met before who you're just engaging with it's like park the technology at the door have a conversation with them and understand what their problems are because actually I had a conversation with a, a group of directors the other day, which is one of our clients, and I went into that meeting thinking issue X would be at the top of their list and their high priority. And actually, after a little bit of conversation, it turned out it was issue Z. It, it, it wasn't what I thought. And actually, you can really get into trouble doing that, because if you walk in the door, assuming you know what the problem is, assuming you've got the solution and assuming that the person is just going to go, well, I'm glad you turned up because you're my savior it probably won't go that way and you'll be disappointed and they'll be disappointed so actually you're back to the old two ears one mouth twice as much of this 
half as much of that, listen to what they have to say. And actually, if you ask the right non-technical questions, they'll tell you what the problem is straight away, absolutely straight away. You won't have to dig for it, it won't take them long, you just let them talk. So I, I think that is the way to do it. Realize that their priorities are completely different to yours and it's your job to find that middle ground. If you don't mind me adding one more thing which I wrote down, if you build trust with a prospect and therefore a client, you can stop selling. Because as soon as you build the trust with the customer, you don't have to sell anymore because you just go, hey, person X, uh, do you want me to sort that out for you? They trust you to sort it out for them. You just get it done. So the, if you stop worrying about the selling and you start focusing on the building of trust, you will have to do less selling in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Richard, what I, I'm I'm kind of moving to the next slide here. One, so there's just more more things to look at, but also I think it kind of builds on some of the things you guys are talking about here. Uh, Richard, what's your thoughts? I want to share a story actually about oh. how our perspective as an MSP and how the client's perspective or what's important to them can be two different things. So I, I said, you know, I used to run a managed service provider business. I'm a techie geek. Used to get in there and do big product projects we did a project for a client the once and it was merging two different active directories okay for those of you who are not techie you've turned off by now for the rest of you but merging two different active directories uh, together and it was a big project for us two different companies merging them together and jb we went in there and we planned it out we got everything working and it come the monday morning we did all this over a weekend come the monday morning and it worked. It was a technological miracle. We were really, really proud of what we'd done there. Then when the users started to sit down, the complaints started to come in. It was nothing to do with the Active Directory. Oh, no, 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 they were like, where's my backdrop gone? I've got pictures of my uh, baby on the backdrop there and it's disappeared. Where was my deleted items gone? I store all my important documents in deleted items. I'm not making this up, by the way, this has actually happened. The point is, is not to say, oh, the users were wrong for that. We never went into them and said, what does success look like for you? Yeah. We went in and said, oh, yeah, we technically know how to solve that issue for you. We merged them and blah, 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 blah. We were really pleased with ourselves. What was really important to them was their personal data. We And, and they, it was stored in places we didn't even know about. Like literally, and let me know in the chat box if you've ever had a user say, oh, don't delete the deleted items because I store important documents there, not the only ones. The point here, and I know this, we're talking about sales is when we go into sales meetings, prospective client meetings, we often assume we know what success looks like for the client. And what success looks like can be, can be a completely different thing. So what I would say is, exactly the same as Craig, zip this, listen more and ask them questions, say, okay, what does success look like? What does the result look like? Because you will find some super, super interesting things. And this is what gives you a competitive advantage. You yeah. can get, uh, you know, your competitors don't ask these questions, you do. And that gives you a real uh, leg up. On on the product management side, and, and Violet, by the way, after I make this statement, I want to see if there are any questions or, or comments here. Um, but on the on the product management side of things right i've been trained to be asking my customers right service providers integrators that are using our our products to say you know what are your pain points right what what are the pitas right what's the pain in the ass that you're trying to get rid of which it's exactly what you guys are saying right and then the other thing is is on questioning another technique that that i've learned to use is you've got to ask the five whys Right? And, and by that, I say, why is this a pain in the ass, right? And then wh whatever their answer is, you got to ask again, why, why is that causing you a problem? And you dive down deep into this to get to the fundamental problem. And once you get to that, and they can't really answer why anymore, that's when you can start working backwards to say, okay, this is, this is how, you know, we're going to help you. Right with this, and, and to, to Craig's point, I think by doing that, and, and your point as well, Richard, by asking questions, by listening more, it really does build up trust. And I think that that's such an important aspect of the sales process. It, Can it, I jump it, in? 
uh, Craig, Ooh, there's yeah. something I want to share because I learned this from from you as well. Um, years ago, I remember sitting in a client, a prospective meeting, and uh, to cut a long story short, it emerged that they tried to fix the problems themselves. Uh, and I remember having the conversation. I can still remember the tapas bar. We were sat having this conversation, Craig. And I jumped in. So I, instead of asking the clients, oh, um, how do you see us helping? And secondly, what have you already tried to do to fix that? I uh, went into the conversation and they shared, oh, well, this is going wrong and we just don't understand it. And I started jumping into problem solving uh, modes and all the rest of it. And what it turns out was the boss had got their nephew who knew about IT because he was a bit good on the Xbox to jump in to try and fix it. When inevitably, when I got to the bottom of that, instead of going, oh, that must have been difficult. I was like, oh, well, there's your problem. You've got somebody stupid to try and fix it. <laughs> Yeah, I was worried. I was going to worry you were going to say his nephew's name was Craig Sharp or something. <laughs> but genuinely, and I had this recently. I had a tradesman come around the house, and we tried to fix a plumbing problem. I, you know, whatever. I'm not a DIY guy. And the plumber came around, and instead of saying, "What have you tried to do to fix this?" Oh, well, I've had a go. Oh, yeah, I can understand. Well, that's going to be difficult. He went. Oh, looks like some idiot's already taken a wrench to this and tried to fix it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm that idiot. Thank you for making me feel really good about it. So the point is not to to poke fun at me, you know, for being rubbish with DIY or to poke fun at the boss's nephew. But I can remember having that conversation with you, Craig, and you saying to me, oh, yeah, making a prospect feel stupid is never going to win you the business. So forgive me for yeah. interrupting. I just wanted to remind you of that conversation. No, I agree with you. And and and, and actually, that's to, that's just to my next and, and final point, because now you want to go to questions, JB. But when you were talking about the five whys, the, deep, the, the deeper, I seem to be talking in cliches and metaphors today, the deeper you dig, the greater value you will find. If you go in and you sell them a Microsoft Office 365 license because they want some email, you'll sell it for whatever it is, 13, 15, 20 dollars, whatever it might be. If you solve those fundamental problems that you find in the five whys, priceless, because that person thinks you're an absolute genius and doesn't necessarily think you're a technical genius, but you've solved their most fundamental problem using a technological solution. So it kind of doesn't really matter to me. But once you get to the heart of what their problems are, if you solve them for them, that is where the value comes from what you offer, because you're no longer just selling them a few office licenses, a bit of backup software, some server management. You're a fundamental problem solver. Yeah, completely agree. So, so Violet, we set you up there. So what questions do we have? Unfortunately, we've had no questions flying in to the question box, so get us your questions. Um, but we do have some questions that came in before the webinar uh, began. Love so it. shall we start with those? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, question number one is, how can we vet a client during the sales process so it's relationship building rather than a qualifying checklist or hot seat experience for the client? No, no, hold on. Is that the one from Sheila? Sheila Bixler? Yes. Is it? Excellent, excellent. So, Richard, Craig, I, do you guys know Sheila? Do you, yeah, do you, she's okay. from MSD based over in Seattle, and she's a very valued part of the tech tribe with us. Seattle? I was, I was just up in Seattle last week for spring break. Oh, you know, you I'm going to see you the next time you are there. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so what's your, what's your thoughts on this, right? I mean, a, uh, uh, how do, she's asking how do we vet a client during the sales process which you know fundamentally is some of these talking points that we have but how do you how do you keep them from feeling like they're in a hot seat right i i, I think i i heard the word checklist so i never take a checklist with me i think i think part of the answer has been given in our conversation around you know two of these one of these go and talk to them go and ask them questions don't ask them technical questions. I have a bit of a killer line, which, which will hopefully tie this up with Domots in a moment, but don't, don't go and ask technical questions. Go and fundamentally ask them about their business. What does their business do? What excites them about their business? What are the challenges in their business? Then maybe dig down with the why, why, why is that a challenge and so on and so forth. And ultimately it's about finding out why they're 
why they've decided at that moment in time to reach out to seek an IT partner. Richard and I are old enough to remember when you'd go to a, cust a customer and they'd not got any IT representation at all. You were like the first person that was going to look after their IT for them. Well, that almost never happens anymore because everyone's got someone that looks after their IT. So you're invariably the next person or the next company. So ask the fundamentals, well, why, why now? What's up with the current provider? Is it service? Is it price? Is it they're not very good? You know, what's the deal? Have a conversation around that. Effectively, I, I know it sounds like this is what I'm saying, and maybe I am. Just avoid having a technical conversation because Richard's point earlier was absolutely right. They will probably see five or six people over that week interviewing. If everyone in that room goes in with the, um, hello, Mr. Smith, how are you? Right, I'd like to ask you the following really obvious and very standard questions that all MSPs you'll meet this week are going to ask you. Well, if the six people and you're one of those six and the other five have done that, A, you're gonna stand out like a sore thumb because you've not done it, so you'll get remembered, always important. And the second thing is, you will find out information that they didn't. And that's the really important thing. And once you've had that, you might have another follow-up meeting, but get over that first hurdle. Make sure they understand where you're coming from. Build the trust. Ask the non-obvious technical questions. And then let them see if they want to invite you back for a follow-up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, building building that trust. And there's... Every, every person, every salesperson, anybody that goes on site, any technician, right? That there, there has to be that trust. One thing that um, I suspect Sheila is, is concerned about as well is when you're building that, that trust, how do, you, how do you make sure you're not falling into complete technical speak? You know, geek speak, I think, is, is a term that we've heard before. One of the things that I want to put out there is it's one thing if you're a sole proprietor and you're the only person, I mean, your business is your business and you're doing it. And if you're the technician and the sales guy and the owner operator, you got to find your, your way of doing things. But if you do have a team, if you have technicians, if you have salespeople, if you um, are, you got to support staff, training is so important, right? Having discussions with your company right holistically about hey these are our values these are how we present ourselves this is how we as a company are going to build trust with our clients is so very important as well um that, that's from my point of view i mean richard what's your thoughts on this and what craig said yeah, so th there's. I'm um, just keeping an eye on the chat box as well because we're we're getting some really interesting <laughs> feedback from uh, from people like people saying Craig 100% agree. Follow up is the key. We've got a sort of a question here around like what do you do if you've got an existing uh, IT provider in there? And and to Sheila's point, you know about or question about building up the trust and rapport there. Like earlier when I said. Um, oh, you know, don't have a go at the client if they've used the boss's nephew to try and fix something. When the client is coming to you and saying, oh, we've got an IT provider, as Craig says, everybody's got an IT provider now, but they're speaking to you. One of your earliest questions should be, why are you considering moving supplier? Now, people don't like to speak ill of other people. So you don't say, tell me all the things that are wrong about your existing provider. That's probably not going to, in rare exceptions, that's probably not going to work out so well. And Gareth said in the chat there, he was like, tell us what you like about your existing provider. I like that because it's a positive way of framing uh, that question. Uh, to Sheila's point, though, the other one is uh, it's usually, you know, some sort of challenge around price. You know, uh, you go into the conversation and you might build good trust with them. You might build a good um, a rapport with them. But if they can't afford to work with you, it's wasted time. And as Craig and I will tell you, having done this for far many, too many years to, uh, uh, to mention now, when you become a really good MSP, you're going to be inundated with inquiries. You're going to have you know, more people wanting to speak to you than you can possibly cope with. If you spend all of your time going around and speaking to people that you've not properly qualified, you are going to end up tearing your hair out in a you know, very short period of time, which is how I ended up like this. 
so what you want to do really early in the conversation is say to them, and I used to start out with this, JB, I used to go into these conversations and say, hey, before we start, just check in, are you shopping on price? Because if you are, we definitely ain't going to be the cheapest. In fact, we're not going to be anywhere close to the cheapest. In fact, we're probably going to be one of the most more expensive ones. Is that going to be a problem? Yeah. Up front, you can establish whether that person is shopping around based on hammering down price, which loads of people are, and you do not want to end up with those clients, you know, and Shirley will know this as, as well as anyone, you know, uh, anybody who beats you up on price typically doesn't end up to be a very good client for you. But don't be surprised if there's clients or prospective clients who say, no, actually, you know, price is important to us, but it's not the thing. Those are the clients that you want to have the conversation with. So, you know, and Craig, you know, you and I have had conversations about this before. During the prospecting stage, it's an interview two ways, isn't it? It's not just, yeah. hey, we want your business. It's about, are you a good fit to work with us? And price, getting that cost element, the elephant in the room up front really early in the conversation can be really powerful. I do a, I, I do a pre-visit. Um, prospect meeting over the phone so let's say we have a cold inbound inquiry I will request that we have a quick conversation just 15 minutes we have a, a pricing template which allows us to price based on a very vague number of sort of users networks servers things like that so I will tell the customer on the phone a very sort of 80% of the way their price for the service that they would look to pay to us and if that causes them worry anxiety or concern we don't follow that up. If you can tell that that price has put them off, why keep going? Because all you're ever going to try to, uh, the only thing you can do to get them is lower your price. And that goes against my fundamental belief. So actually, particularly when there's distances to travel and people want you to visit, you go if there's a more than 50% chance that it's it's going to turn into, into work. But you can have a, a conversation with them over the phone, give them an indicative price. And if they fall, if you hear a thud and they've fallen off their chair, then you go, well, OK, maybe that's not the customer we need to go well, and follow up with. I was going to say therein lies, per the conversation we had at the very beginning, Craig, part of your clandestine interview process, right? I mean, that that right there in my mind is a very good secret tip to to let's call it a tool or something that people can utilize, right? And and it also speaks to what Richard just said, which is, you know, if, if the customer reacts, right, if this potential client reacts in a certain way that you perceive as negative towards your end goals, right, what your company mission is, how you want to treat others, I think that's a really important, let's call it red flag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, Another thing that, that you said there, Richard, which I, I you know, I kind of latched onto was um, at the beginning was the fact that, you know, when you're in this interview process, um, it's it's really important for you to feel good about, you know, who you're talking to and, and the things that are that are, are being said there. If they are, if they're willing to tell you all the negative stuff about the current MSP, it's important to note that that's going to be a customer that does the same about you if it doesn't yes. work out. And yeah. word of mouth is so important in this business, right? I mean, Violet and I spend a lot of time dealing with digital marketing and, and doing a lot of sales, but what we find so valuable in our business is word of mouth, right? People using us, people talking about us, and if you don't have a good relationship, in the forums if you don't have a good relationship via word of mouth it's not going to be good so i think that's important mm -hmm. definitely i put Just up to I let put everyone up. know the question box has gone a bit crazy since we last spoke so i'd like to get through some of these um it always, so, it always does with six minutes left on a webinar <laughs> yeah okay oh we have um we'll answer all the questions okay yeah. um so uh, Craig, this one's for you. You mentioned the five whys. Could you please state those because we missed them? Well, well here's the interesting thing. It was JB who mentioned the five whys. Hey, to no, be, you to be can honest. take the credit for it, Craig. You can take the credit for it. Yeah. yeah. Those, those five whys, you know, I, the, the real important aspect of the five whys is not necessarily what follows the word why as much as listening to what, how they answer the question 
and then interpreting why they answered the question that way, right? I think you need to be able to say, uh, you know, if somebody says, if somebody says, I do, I'll just throw out something, I don't like the color of the sky today, okay? You have to be able to ask, well, why is it that you don't like the color of the sky? And they can say, well, it seems gray. Well, then you need to say, well, it's likely because there are clouds in the sky. Why do you? Why does that cause you grief, right? I mean, you kind of pursue down deep until they finally say, they may get to the point where it's like, well, I just found out it was my birthday and nobody said happy birthday, right? I mean, who knows, right? You, you have to dive down deep into their frustrations at which point when they can really no longer answer that why question, which usually it's around three to five whys, depending on how how they, uh, <laughs> I felt like I said three to five wives, and I, I've only had one, just to be clear. <laughs> but, but it's those whys, once you dive into that, then you can start to say, okay, here are potential solutions for that. So that's really what was meant by that. So it's a great question. Um, yeah, but, but I mean, to, to the point, there are no, there are no definitive five whys it's just whatever re response the client comes up with you just go well why so my earlier point about a client saying i have some concerns about home working oh why is that what are your concerns uh well i'm worried that the you know security of uh, actually if you dig down their issue might be i'm not really sure they're doing any work at home and i'd like to find out what they're actually doing when they're not in the office now that is a completely different answer to secure home working with vpns but, and it's a totally different tool right it's and, a and it would be a, a totally different tool as as well so that's why you just kind of keep asking why until you reach a dead end yeah love it what else violet we'll get on to the next one um so i think a, a two people asked us but how can we use domots to help identify sales opportunities and we had um, what's the best practice to use a Domots box as part or phase two of a prospecting engagement? And I think definitely, Craig, I think all of you have some knowledge on yes. this. And I, <laughs> I totally appreciate that. You know, as the guy with the Domots logo here and here and all the swag I can possibly find, I appreciate appreciate the question. And, and Craig, I mean, you, you've played with Domots. Richard, you've played with Domots. I know you've monitored your gerbil cameras with them. Uh, guinea pig JB, let's get the facts right. Oh, excuse me, sorry, sorry, <laughs> the guinea <laughs> pig, yes. But um, yeah, I, I definitely have a perspective on how, how domots can be used, but I'd rather hear from you guys. Um, and I think even our, our listeners would rather hear from you about your thoughts on what domots can do for this. Craig, can I throw one out that, that, that I picked up on really early in? I think this is a massive growth um, area uh, for MSPs. Most of us are focused on backups. And we all know that a backup is only as good as the restore. And we've all been in that horrible situation where we um, don't keep an eye on the backup. And then the client says in a panic phone call, I've deleted such and such file or somebody's left the business and they've maliciously wiped out all these files or something. We've all been there and you go, no problem. I'm going to restore it from the backup. And yeah, the backup doesn't work. And oh, yeah. And it becomes we've all been there at some point in, you know, immature in our, our IT career. Where I see a big opportunity, um, JB, is uh, with Domots is you can monitor IP cameras, CCTV cameras, security cameras. And you and I were having a conversation because as, as you just joked about earlier, I've got an IP camera, uh, you know, um, in at my home here. Uh, we've got IP cameras looking over the guards, and I've even got one in the guinea pig cage, believe it or not. Told you I'm a geek now, do you believe me? The I point do. here is <laughs> most of your clients have got IP cameras, security cameras sitting around. They are not worried particularly about whether those IP cameras are working up until the point that they get broken into or there's an attempted break in or some other security situation takes place. Then they say, can you pull up the footage and you say, well, we'll take a look at it. Ah, the camera has been offline for six months or it's not been recording to disk or whatever it might be. And so for me, you know, as a purely as from a techie perspective, I was looking at Domots and the ability that you've got to look at the OnVIF uh, cameras there and actually test whether things are working and to see the backups, uh, sorry, the, uh, the recordings working in that. 
I think is a is a huge thing, and you know it's low hanging fruit for MSPs. But JB, does that make sense? You often come across that sort of scenario. It, it does. It absolutely does. You know, and I think that that right there. Here's the challenge that I see with prospecting on that. That to me, Richard, is absolutely a solution to what I would consider to be revenue generation opportunities for the MSP. I think one of the challenges and some of the you know, even some of the questions that have come in here. Um, in addition to this is how do I get in the door to a customer? And I, yeah. you know, Domo's in that solution on the camera side. I think it's a it's a great way to. I mean, you could ask the question. It's like, hey, do you know what? <laughs> do you know where your cameras are? Right? Do you know what the state of your cameras are in? I mean, that's a nice simple question. But I think there are other ways that Domo's. And, and actually, it was very opportunistic because I had that slide where we were talking about network audits and stuff. But um, I think it's a, there are other ways in which domos can be very powerful to say things like, in some sense, do you know where your kids are, right? Here you can say, do you know what's on your network, right? Are you aware of all these things that are out there? That's one thing that I see as powerful. To your point, Richard, cameras and the integration that we've done with OnViv cameras and stuff, I think is an amazing solution and it just makes it even better for why you can charge more to your customers. But that initial that initial um, interview, so to speak, I think it becomes really powerful. I mean, and, and Craig, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, for, I, I wrote something down while we were talking earlier. So hopefully, like a really good comedian sketch, this is a callback to the beginning, <laughs> which is we've we've spoken about how you don't talk tech. We've spoken about how you need to keep the tech talk down when you talk to customers. So what I've written on my little bit of paper in a Darren Brown style here is, if you use Domots, then it answers the technical questions for you so that the customer doesn't have to be involved in that process. Because whilst you're talking to prospects about their systems, you need good information to be able to give realistic responses to well, how complicated will this project be? What devices are there that I need to charge for? What things am I not being told about that, that's on the network? So there's a question in the Q&A about a, a phase two use of, of, of a Domots box. I, like you, happen to have one of these. Yeah. Look at that. And that is what goes to a customer site, well, sorry, a phase two prospect site once we've had the initial conversation where we say, is this price too expensive? No. Uh, are the services we're offering suitable for you? Yes. OK, if we go to phase two, what we need to do is a bit more detail about your system so we can price it correctly. Can I pop in, add this onto your network, leave it there for a couple of days? That will build up a bit of information about your network and I will be much better armed to come back to you and give you a more realistic understanding about a, what's going on, and B, how we would charge to look after that for you. So um, I know when people talk about the Domots box, they don't necessarily literally mean a box, but that's one of the tools that we use, as well as installing software on servers and stuff like that. But that to... deployed as a temporary device, you don't have to get an admin password to add it onto a server. You just literally pop this on the network. Fantastic. Works every time. I would add to that, you know, Craig, what you're saying, I, I think is is very pertinent. I would love to hear in the chat when I'm, I'm going to pull a Richard Tuff here. I'd love to hear in the chat window, right? <laughs> you know, people's perspective on how many times have they asked the customer, right? Or a potential client. It's like, hey, how many systems are we monitoring here? What's on the network? And then they find out that it's, you know, 50% more devices or 100% more devices, right? People aren't aware of you know, all the IoT devices, right? All these network connected systems, whether it's people's watches, right? Their smart watches, it's their phones, it's the Alexas that they have sitting on the desk, right? It's all these random things that are that 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 are frankly stealing bandwidth from a critical data infrastructure network. And it's affecting business, right? And and I think people need to know that. That's and true. But also, I think one of the things that it does is it, it just gives you the opportunity to, to, to really demonstrate that you're on your game as well. Because if you can put a, a non-impactful device onto their network, gather some data, 
and then go back to them a, a week or so later with that information, then I actually think that's a that's a really powerful demonstration. And the final thing I would say about why the Domots box stops you having to seek out these technical answers for questions a customer just probably doesn't know. You know, let's turn it round. If someone asked me today, what type of oil goes in my car's transmission? I got no idea. I wouldn't know, but it's it's my car. I drive it every day. Maybe it's a question that someone would assume I would know the answer to, but I really don't. So again, back to what we spoke about earlier, in your mind, you're thinking, well, surely you know where your DNS is managed. Surely you've got the domain name access. Surely you know what the IP address for your internet service is. Surely you know all of that. Well, the Domots box will tell you big chunks of that information without you having to kind of back to Richard's point, make the client think they're a bit thick because they didn't know the answer to that. Yeah. Rob makes a good point in the, the chat as well. I, I should say you've started something here, Craig, because people are saying, how can I get out of a Demot box? I'm going to leave you guys to one for a vastly overinflated <laughs> price. <laughs> Rob makes a really good point, actually, because he says they've used uh, Demot and it extends the MSP reach to discover additional devices that standard RMM tools don't find now everybody is running a remote monitoring and maintenance tool but it's not necessarily picking up the ring doorbell the uh, multifunction uh, printer scanner copier the it, there's all sorts of things the ip cameras and other things around there that is for me low-hanging fruit you know when you go in there and to say hey we can look after these things as well if you don't jb i'll just say this to to sort of conclude the point on it if you are not aware of those devices as an msp and you take the customer on you are going to end up supporting them anyway because anything that's got a plug at the end of anything that's got an ip address ultimately your client is going to look to you to support oh, even if it's on a best endeavor basis so trust me when i speak from experience here you would much rather have a conversation with them up front and factor that into the contract than them saying oh yeah the um did we not tell you about the payroll pc that's sitting in the corner disconnected from everything else Oh yeah, that's a key part of our managed service agreement. It's not on the paper. We still want you to support it. Yeah, yeah, completely. Hey, we're going into a shotgun round of questions now. If that's okay, if I <laughs> jump in there because we're running out of time and there's quite a few ones I want to get through um, before we take off. So we've had a few uh, people ask about. Um, um, getting into the door and how you can find and locate prospective customers and just if we could keep this one short and just give uh, some of your best tips that you can for people looking for this um the answer to this question sure should we jump in there i mean first one for me would be go where your customers are so uh, in a pre-covid world i would be going out to networking events and i would be um uh, shaking hands with people and i would be listening to what they need not looking for customers i would be seeing how i could help people in the covid world that we live in Go to LinkedIn, see if you can add value to the conversations, reach out to people, ask them how they're getting on with their business, that type of thing, that's that's a, a big one. So networking is networking, whether it's offline or online, but you should be doing that and fairly regularly. I think be helpful, go back to Jay's, JB's earlier point about being helpful. So for example, we produced a couple of sort of 10, 12 page PDFs about working from home, security, how to avoid email scams, things like that. Those are things that can be pushed out through your normal mailing lists. You know, you, you may want to try and capture information from people that visit your website, but the thing is that's quite difficult. So you can amalgamate a couple of things, maybe try to get a mailing list via information you get via LinkedIn, maybe uh, uh, look back at mailing lists that you've had and refresh them, start sending out information to people. It's all about numbers, really. You will have to send that information out so it lands on the right day at the right time. So just do something every every two weeks or every month so that you're sending useful information out and eventually the people receiving it will go these guys are really helpful they seem better than the incumbent IT provider we've got at the moment maybe we should have a conversation with them it's just one of those opportunities we used to call yeah. it giving them a tickle didn't we Craig yes indeed yeah. <laughs> you know, I want to I want to add to it here just and I'll try to be quick although I can probably go on for 10 minutes on this particular subject <laughs> I mentioned earlier, word of mouth is so important. Um, I, I think the current customers you do have, 
should be a source of trust like we've talked about and i think you need to continue to foster that trust right and build uh, make sure they're successful right you keep them successful here's why i say this it's because if you're making them successful they want to make sure you're successful with that the way they can help you be successful is to improve your business you guys both as msps right craig and richard you you knew each other right and you, this is one of those things where the raising tide raises all ships right in some sense and i think word of mouth spreads and when one msp has another msp that's a friend and colleague even if, even if they're competitors right if they want to see somebody be successful they're going to try to help you as well because they want to see you be successful. So I think that's another way to get into the door. I mean, it kind of goes along Richard's line of networking, social networking, right? However you you need to do that. In a world of COVID where it's more online, um, that's there, there's different tactics for how you can get in the door, but being helpful, building that trust um, and communicating is is so important, I think. I could go on, but I'll stop at that. And Violet was shocked. Did you see that? She's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe somebody asked that question. So no, I think I'm usually, went, I I'm think usually went, answering I, questions during a webinar with my uh, camera off. So now I, sorry, I, I, I think really she, didn't well, I think she was surprised about that, JB, where she went, oh my God, JB has shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's We're true. like, oh my God, so many questions. Which one shall I pick? Okay. Um, uh, so for the next question, um, uh, well, we, there's a kind of three that we can merge together and um, it's like, how are you implementing donuts boxes at customer sites? I think that Craig covered that, how he brings that in in the beginning. And then I guess there's some period of transition. If they do sign up to you, then the box stays there and is part of your service delivery. That's, that's and, correct, and, yeah, because we're, we're a predominant cloud provider, so we actually don't have that many sites where there would be a server, quote unquote, to install. So we actually have many more of these deployed in the field than, than maybe you might think. But yeah, we use that as our point of presence for the MOTS on the network. Okay, so, and when you're in advance of this putting out there, do you tell the customers like what this box is doing to build trust with them or? Yeah, I saw that was a question that was posed. And yeah, it's just total transparency. It, it, it's just saying to them, look, you know, I going back to that point about if Domots is doing the work, they don't have to get technical. It's a, it's about saying, look, I you you must understand, or I assume that you understand that, you know, these networks can be complicated. And as part of the work that we want to do to make sure we give you a full and frank understanding of your network and pricing that might be part of that, this box will just tell us the devices that are on the network, we can't access them. We can't. Uh, we don't know any passwords. There's no. There's no way that we can do anything other than just see that there's a device, and this box will tell us what the manufacturer is, and and so we get an idea about whether it's a computer or a laptop or a CCTV camera or whatever. And to, to the other point there, can I get a PDF report? Yes, you can. You can print off a PDF report at the end, take it to your meeting, and go, dear Mr. or Mrs. Customer, here are all the things we found. 90% of them are what we expect, but do you happen to know what this is? Or we found this thing here, did you know that was there? But those are questions that you can pose with the report. Another another question came in, I think it was from AJ on there as well, about visibility within the network. And, and one thing I wanna to add to the, your point there, Craig, is you know, if a customer tells you that they've got X number of devices that are on there, but Domo comes back with you know a fraction of that or something less, that has to raise questions as well. It's like, well, wait a minute. Here's what we see. Is there, do you have things VLAN off? Do you have it on a separate network? Right? Let's, it gives you that, it gives you that, um, that time to ask questions as well. So. Knowledge is power, and ultimately, Domots is giving you a lot of knowledge, which, as Richard pointed out earlier, if you don't have the Domots box or the Domots information in advance of securing that that prospect as a customer, you learn about it after the event and you either have then taken on a burden that you didn't realize or you have undercharged for the devices that were actually in, 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 in that location. Um, so 
I think that answers the, the majority of questions in some way or another. We didn't get too much into the, the question on sales because I guess that would be another. Well, we did. Actually, I'll make a note to send the previous webinars that we've done on marketing and reaching your customers in the past. Uh, so this kind of wraps things up for today. Um, and we'll be hosting a follow-up episode, part two in the clandestine interview um, in the weeks ahead. Yes, so we, I'm pretty excited about that. I mean, we, based on the questions that we received, the comments, uh, we'll absolutely do a follow on to this. Um, I suspect that you know, as people are viewing this more and more, they're gonna wanna connect with us and ask more questions, whether that's to Craig or you, Richard. Um, connect with us, right? Reach out to support at Domotes, reach out to sales at Domotes. Uh, connect with us on, on LinkedIn and, and Twitter and all those Instagram things. Uh, Craig, Richard, I wanna say it was a good time talking to you. I always enjoy talking to you and this has been a lot of fun and got some humor. The one thing that we need to remember next time, Violet, is do not let Richard hit the broadcast button. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Richard. Yeah, Violet, you yeah. You don't even know that the first thing that JB says when you enter is don't hit the broadcast button. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. <laughs> so for anybody watching this on the replay, I turned up 10 minutes early. We were all having a chat. I clicked, yeah, broadcast, and everybody freaked out. And I was like, eh, we'll just carry on talking. <laughs> I'm like, so Richard, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> just how I roll, Violet, sorry. I just hope that the that the presentation today has has given someone a a little little taste of what might come along in part two because we could certainly go into more detail. We can expand perhaps on what we've spoken about, or maybe just start to go down the the, the, the sort of Domots route and and how you can really utilise that. I've got some stories about how we've used it recently uh, to actually solve some relatively complicated problems really quickly and really easily in kind of real world scenarios. So if people are interested in those, look out for part two. Love it. And just wanna say again, thank you so much, Craig and Richard for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. It's been My a lot pleasure, of really enjoyed it, thank you. Okay. See you soon. <laughs>